Uh, first of all, I want to say thanks very much uh, for the lunch today. It was lovely. I had particularly nice apple pie and cream. I had actually two slices of it. So I, I saw there was a few others having a, a, a few slices as well. So I said, you know, people might be feeling a little bit tired. So I'd like to wake you all up by a little bit of a history lecture. Because that always gets the blood flowing. But we'll keep, we'll keep it very short on that stage. 1910, not today or yesterday, thanks be to God. There was an, a gentleman in Chicago, he was a surgeon by the name of uh, Ernest Codman, and he had ideas like what we've heard about here only a while ago. And he said, I'm working day in, day out in this hospital, and he said, I'd like to see whether we're providing the care that people want. So he was an influential individual, and he got a, a, a group of hospitals, quite a large group of hospitals, to come together and say, well, look, for a period of months, let's look at some basic things. And I mean basic. One, do you have a medical staff in your hospital? Fair enough. Are they chosen because they actually graduated? I think that would have been important. Do you meet? Do you actually chat? Do you have medical records? And do you have a laboratory? Simple enough in today's standards. God knows we could pass that without breaking a sweat. We wouldn't need HICWA or we wouldn't need even to consider it ourselves. But what we found out, was, or what they found out was, out of the 692 hospitals at that time in 1910, only 89 of them could actually pass that level of care. The standards were so bad, the results were so bad, they were so afraid it would get out into the public that in the Waldorf Astoria, yeah, they were slumming it a little bit, they burned them in the fireplace. And the problem that they had there was that they just had no way of demonstrating well, what have we got? We say we have good care, but when we start to look at it, we're not able to demonstrate it. And the other problem is, we don't really know where to start. Where should we look at? What do we need to consider? And unfortunately, it wasn't until 50 years later that the regulation actually came into the US to lay down some minimum standards. That's the end of the history lesson, by the way. Now, what have we got today? Well, today it's different, and I'm talking at the moment with regards to the Irish framework. And uh, in 2011, we carried out some research. Now, this is in the acute sector. I'll, I'll get to where we are today in a second. And we identified that there was a plethora, this is the only word we can use, of regulatory bodies being involved. Uh, we identified over 48 different organizations who are all looking for information, all good organizations, focused people looking for different things. So it was the colleges, or it was the, the on-board alternate, or it was in the laboratories, or it was health promotion, or it was infection control, or what have you. And one of the reasons that this occurred was a, back in the good days, 2005 or so on, when problems occurred, we actually reacted with, let's see if we can regulate it, let's see if we can put in more standards in relation to it. But interestingly enough, when we also did that, we asked the question, again within the hospitals, are there any gaps? 46 different forms of regulation, and 77% of those that, that we, we, we interviewed or that we got fe feedback from said there were gaps. And where the gap was, and thanks be to God, it's a case now where we hear what, what Mary is saying with regards to HICWA, that that gap has been filled. That gap was one framework. If you have independent regulation, you have systems regulation, you have health and safety authority, you have infection control, it was just pulling left, right, and center. So what, what is missing to date is, is still that framework. And this is where the HICWA framework, which was the last slide that, that, that Mary showed you, is something that's, that's greatly welcomed and, and the work that, that is going on. What I want to talk to you about, though, is a similar framework in many ways, that it is an organizational-wide approach to looking at how we provide quality of care. And I listened to all the presentations today from finance, from TQM, from looking at data analysis, from the minister saying, you know, we have to be able to demonstrate it. It is a framework that takes in every single part of this and puts it into an area that starts to communicate within your own organization. Now, accreditation is not regulation. It is a voluntary process. So earlier on, I heard we were preaching to the converted. I hope you are. This is a, a, a plea to organizations to realize that these frameworks are provided. Now, accreditation is not for everyone. It is about centers of excellence. So there are very specific standards that are looking for organizations who really want to push the boat out. 
not for organizations who are happy to say, yeah, we've got it. We've got the basics in. It's good. No, we're great. And we're even going further. And just to give you an indication of that, if you look at the, the nursing home sector, which has been regulated for, for the last number of years, there is a, oh, in, in excess of about 700 nursing homes. There are only three nursing homes who are voluntarily applying for accreditation, who want to go to that next level and, and to push it out. So what we have is, is a framework for organizations and a very specific one for primary care, which focuses on, at the start, the clinical care delivered to the actual patient, and then the overall organizational structure of how that care is delivered. More and more we see this being the requirement of stakeholders such as VHI with regards to ensuring that you are carrying out that accreditation. So accreditation internationally is a, is a pretty accepted uh, format. The one that I want to talk to you today about is actually the, the oldest one, and it was where Ernest Codman linked in, uh, the Joint Commission, uh, which was founded in 1950 in the States. It now accredits in excess of 19,000 organizations. And the international wing of that, which we are partnered with, is the Joint Commission International. They first came to Ireland in 1999. They, they accredit over 400 different organizations throughout the world, 85 different countries in total. So who are we? We're the small little bit over there. Uh, we're a Galway-based company. We're based in Galway and Melbourne. The commute gets difficult now and again. And we work with all types of organizations working to develop the quality and risk, the types of things that Mary was referring to, the, the simple things and the complex things to try and make sure that people are, are operating as best as possible. And in a lot of cases, fulfilling regulation. There's so much regulation that, that, that is out there. Today, uh, over 100 years on since Ernest Codman did start to have that chat to see about the basics, Joint Commission Accreditation accredits some of the prime organizations providing healthcare in the world, everything from the Mayo Clinic to the John Hopkins. In Ireland, since 1999, we have 22 organizations who are accredited, many of which you would be well aware of, uh, including the Matter Private, sponsoring today, Hermitage Clinic, BlackRock, etc. We've now seen the change in, in the last two years since we, we started to partner with the accreditation body, with Joint Commission, we're moving into different areas. So the VHI home care and other home care providers are now on the path towards accreditation. And the main driver for them is public demonstration of their commitment to quality, but also financial demonstration when it comes to funding from the HSE. Uh, we've also seen now with regards to the ambulance services over the next 12 months, private ambulance services are all, are all moving towards it. In relation to primary care, this is one of our objectives, to work with the Joint Commission International to introduce primary care accreditation on a voluntary basis. Uh, it has been operating in Spain, Brazil, the United Arab Nations, and uh, in, in Singapore uh, quite effectively over the last number of years. The standards were first introduced uh, in 2009 and uh, have been operating effectively since. So what does that mean? Well, the standards are there. It's a primary care framework. So essentially, if an organization is setting up a primary care center in the morning and said, well, you know what would be handy? A book to tell me what's important and what I can leave to the side. And that's really where the framework is about. And it starts with the primary focus about the patient. And the patient from even before they have started to interact with the primary care center itself. So how we engage with the community, how we become part of that overall community in relation to it. Once the patient has engaged within the primary care, how we manage the processes, how we assess, how we have standardized care, how we identify where the rights are, how we understand the need for the education of not just the patient and the family. And it's not a case of, you know what would be nice? Let's have some education. But it is evidence-based best practice, international best practice on these are the things you should be doing. This is what makes an effective primary care center with regards to structure, with regards to governance, with regards to leadership. It moves on then from the patient side of it into the organization side of it, facilities, staff, qualifications, all of these aspects, whether it's the Health and Safety Authority looking at OC Health, whether it's the colleges and the nursing colleges looking for specific medical practitioner accreditation or CPD, etc. That framework is all integrated into it. And then how do we use that? How do we develop the quality information with regards to it? I put up on the screen there, it's 
not really, no need to go reading it in any detail, about the structure that the standards are there. So to give you an example, PCS, a pa patient care standard, it talks about the centre providing care and treatment that is uniformed. That's always a concern. Well, everyone is different. We have our own clinical expertise. Um, but it goes into it into the extent of there are areas which we have to ensure that a patient coming in with the same type of symptoms, the same issues, gets the same quality of care, no matter when or who they actually see. And then breaking it down within each of those is the measurable elements. And there's quite a significant number uh, with regards to, to the, the, the overall. In addition, thanks. In addition, there are patient safety goals, which are driven home, which are the core aspects of it. In addition to that, we have a lot of detail with regards to measurement. And the concept of measurement has discussed a lot today. The Joint Commission and International have spent the last number of years developing a library of measures. Basically, what is measured, what, why is it beneficial, whether it's clinical, patient satisfaction, financial, administrative, etc. So that exists there, and this framework, this accreditation process, uh, provides that. In addition, it's not just about internal development. There is that external concept of it, a peer review process, which utilizes what they call trace methodology, which takes sample patients and tracks them through the primary care center to see all the different aspects, how it links, how it works, from the nurse or the GP that was dealing with them to the piece of equipment and whether it was maintained or not. So it's a rigorous thing that shows the interaction uh, with regards to it. And these are people who have been involved in different types of, uh, of systems similar to your own. And the surveyors come from the States, they come from Spain, they come from Brazil, they come from all over the world. Accredited organizations in Ireland and part of our partnership with, with JCI is to support that. And again, it's, it's very reflective of, of, of the work that HICWA are doing and, and I'm sure we'll be able to, to, to link in with that. It is about newsletter of items that are good, things that are going on with accredited organizations. It's about creating a network with like-minded organizations. So we have specific initiatives that are going on with accredited hospitals and accredited home care and accredited uh, uh, ambulatory care, etc. We provide specific education, patient safety seminar, and we ensure that they're promoted, that this accreditation is not an easy thing to achieve. It is not an easy thing for people to take on with regards to the day-to-day -day workload. It is something that is effective. It is something that provides evidence-based best practice, that provides a continuous striving uh, for, uh, for centers of excellence and to show that reputation with regards to it. There's huge amounts of evidence with regards to accreditation and what works and what doesn't. But I think the last slide is probably a good way of, of driving it home. St. Vincent's University Hospital was the first public hospital to undergo uh, JCI accreditation coming up on three years ago. And the CEO would be a great salesman for it, but he'd be a bit expensive to bring around. Basically said it has changed the way that they provide care. It has been clinician driven because it is clinically focused, but it helps the business in the way that they operate. It is not for everyone, but it is available now it is a framework to develop the, the, the centers and, I d and will ultimately lead to fulfilling all of the other areas of regulation that comes along. Tomorrow, well, I'd hope to talk to some of you. Thanks very much.